Wait, what? There's two of them? That's right. The RP2040, as I've mentioned throughout the series, is a dual-core processor, which means we got twice the performance and twice the problems. So tonight we're going to be talking about the single-cycle I.O. block and its multi-core functionality. So if you haven't already pulled up the documentation, I don't know what you're doing with your life, and head over to section 2.3, the processor subsystem. So as you can see in this visual, the CO is this component within the processor subsystem that acts as an intermediate between the two cores. So the structure of the CO is actually pretty simple. We have the CPU ID registers, the FIFA registers, the hardware spin locks, the integer dividers, the interpolators, and then the GPIO registers. So I've already covered the GPIO registers. Um, these are by definition atomic because uh, both cores share them. But for the most part, all the other registers, each core uh, just has their own version. So Core 0 and Core 1 both have their own CPU ID register. Um, they have their own integer dividers. They have their own interpolators. So tonight I'm going to cover um, each of these registers except for the GPIO registers because I've already covered those. And also uh, I'm going to skip over the interpolators since those can be a, th that's like a whole video in and of itself. Because ARM doesn't have a division operation, it is up to uh, hardware to implement division. So to get feedback from the divider, I think the easiest way is to just blink the number from the LED. So let's, uh, let's create a function. Uh, let's call it LED count. And we will, um, so all this will do is take a, uh, a value into a register. Let's say, um, also, oh, this is good practice before we get started. We, should, we really should be doing this all the time, is just push the link register on the stack and then pop it directly into the PC so we can have uh, nested functions. But um, yeah, and then we'll have this like, um, we'll move. So all functions, uh, their first arguments are always going to start at R0. So let's, uh, let's assume the values in R0 and then move that into R3 because the other functions we'll be using R3, and then we'll have this loop. So we'll say um, LED count zero, and then compare R3 with zero. And this is where assembly gets a little messy. So let's uh, we'll have like an LED count two. I I think we're gonna need another loop. And then we'll say um, branch if equal LED count two. So that will end the program. So if the number is already zero, we're not going to blink any more times. And then actually, I think we only need one. And then after that, we will um, branch to LED on, delay, branch to LED off delay and then we'll subtract one from r3 and then go back to the loop so the idea is we have some number in r0 and then we um until it's zero we'll blink the led so if it's already zero this will just end it if not we'll just be in this loop that will keep turning the LED on and off until the uh, the register is down to zero. So to test this, let's uh, let's get rid of this junk and then just uh, move, let's say three into R zero, and now let's call that function and upload our code to the Pico. So now when I upload my code, we get three blinks, which means that the function is working correctly. The operation of the divider is absolute cake. All you got to do is store a dividend and a divisor into the registers. Uh, it supports both signed and unsigned division. So just specify which, uh, which register you write to. And once that happens, the division will take place. So the division is eight clock cycles long. So you can either pull this uh, ready bit in the status register, or you could just wait eight clock cycles. They literally say in the documentation, it doesn't matter. So to me, waiting eight clock cycles, just a fixed eight clock cycles seems simpler than having to pull this bit. Um, so the output will be put in two registers. The quotient will be put here and the remainder will be put here. 
So after eight clock cycles, this, uh, these registers should be filled. And um, the cool thing about this is that the division also, uh, it doubles as a modulo operation. So we kind of get two operations in one. So to see this in action, let's, uh, let's get rid of this. And then let's, uh, let's just load our CO address. So load that into register zero. And then we'll, um, what is that? So let's just do a simple uh, unsigned division. So we'll put 12 here. So that is an offset of, just move 12 into R1 and then store that in um, six. So that would be uh, 24. Store that into 24 and then move um, 13. No, let's do three. Let's do three and then store that into 25. So that is our divisor. And then uh, we just wait eight clock cycles. So move R0, R0. So after eight clock cycles, we can get the results back. So let's um, let's load the quotient into R6. So that is gonna be an offset of 28. So 28 and then let's load um, the remainder to R7, so that will be one word above the quotient. And now we can um, we can get the results. So let's move R6 into R0, and then call our uh, little counting function. And then we'll have like some delays, so we don't, so we know uh, what's the quotient and what's the remainder. And then after that, we can move. R7 into R, uh, R0. So for 12 divided by 3, let's upload this. And we got a 4. So to see the modulo in action, let's, um, let's give it a 5 instead of a 3. So for 12 divided by 5, we get 2 for our quotient and 2 for our remainder. Yeah, division's important at all, but uh, everyone really came here to gain access to that second core. So before we do that, we need some sort of identification to know which core uh, our code is running on. And this is done with the CPU ID register. So this register is going to have the same address for both cores, but it's going to return different values. So for core 0, it's going to return a 0. For core 1, it's going to return a 1. So let's take a look at this register. Uh, let's get rid of this code. And load, um, let's just load it into R0 since we'll just send it to the LED count function. The CPU ID is going to be the very first register. So this is just going to be an offset of 0. So if we run this, nothing happens because we're executing this code from core 0. So before we can launch core 1, we have to understand how the cores communicate. So in between the cores, we have these FIFO registers. And this stands for first in, first out. And these are essentially just one-way data streams. So data can only be sent from core 0 to core 1 with this FIFO. And data can only be sent from core 1 to core 0 with this FIFO. So each core, um, there are two FIFOs. And they can only be written by one core. And they can only be read by the other core. So this is a great way of sending information without creating the risk of race conditions. So to use the FIFOs, we need uh, three registers. We have this FIFO status register, which has four flags. We only care about two of them. Uh, the ready flag, which is the uh, tells us if the FIFO is not full, i.e. we can uh, send more data to it. And then the valid flag, which tells us if the FIFO is not empty, i.e. we can read from it. And then we have the FIFO write register, and this is the register we send data to. And then the read register, and this is the uh, register we read data from. So let's add some more functions to our uh, to our arsenal. So let's go down here and let's say um, first let's go FIFO send, and we'll load. Uh, let's again let's assume the uh, the data we're sending is in register zero. So let's load the CO into register one, and then we'll load. Uh, We'll load that status bit into register 2. 
So C O sorry R zero. And then that is an offset of um let's see five. So that would be twenty. So an offset of twenty. And then we'll move um two into R three because we wanna if we if we're sending something we wanna make sure it's not full. So we're gonna pull that and then say um well first we need a and it so and r2 and r3 so if that bit is not set then we'll have to branch back to the beginning of the function and then once we're out of that loop we can uh we can store our data into the um yeah, this should be register one we can store that data into the transmit fifo which is going to be uh an offset of 21 words and then branch back to the link receiving is very similar so let's uh, let's copy this code also before I do that we'll need to send an event this is very important so the uh, usually the core will expect an event to be sent before it reads it so one once we get access to it that won't matter but for now that does so we'll send an event and let's say FIFA receive and instead of the second bit we'll just care about the first bit and then um, instead of branching to FIFO send we're gonna have to branch to FIFO wait for event because in, instead of sending an event we'll have to wait for it so let's say FIFO WFE wait for event and then branch back so now we can load this into R0 and this will be at an offset of 22 so that is our FIFO read register and then after that let's create a FIFO drain function so this will just make sure that the FIFO is empty before we use it so FIFO drain and then let's get that CO address and then we'll load um, just load into R1 we'll load whatever whatever data is in there and then we'll load uh, the status bit and we'll say that um, you know let's check it as empty so then and uh, r1 and r2 and then branch back to the beginning while there's still data in the FIFO and when we're done we'll uh, send an event and then branch back to link. So the documentation has a great code example on how to launch the second core. So there's this command sequence that you'll send the vector table, the stack pointer, and the entry point to the second core. And while you're sending this information, it should be echoing it back to you. So you start off with 001, and it should echo back to you 001. And then once that is successful, you can then send your vector table, your address to the vector table, the stack pointer, and then the entry point. And if at any time you uh, it doesn't echo it back to you correctly, you then have to start over. So there's kind of like this loop, like do, command sequence. Uh, you'll drain the FIFOs and then um, send, the, send over the information. So let's create a uh, init core function that we can call at any point. And um, this is good practice when you're using like uh, like big functions like these. You want to push the link register on at the very end, pop it into the PC. And um, for good practice, you should always do this: is pop off as much as you push on. So um, other func since other functions are going to expect their values to be in the same place on the stack as they left them. So after that, we can drain our FIFO so FIFO drain and then we're going to store a uh, we're gonna send it a zero over so move zero and then branch to the uh, FIFO send and then we'll FIFO uh, receive that from the FIFO and then compare our zero to zero we're gonna need a, a little inner loop so in it core zero zero so we don't push on our link register again and then we'll uh, branch if not equal to init core zero 
So that will make us start over. And then let's uh, let's copy this. So then uh, we'll do this all again. And then we can do this with a 1. But uh, we're not going to have to drain the FIFA this time. So just uh, move a 1 into that. Now I don't actually feel like creating a vector table. So we're just going to send it a uh, SRAM address. Let's just send it to the very beginning. And th this is just going to be garbage. We'll just assume it won't have to use it. So um, what am I doing? Branching to the SRAM. Let's just load. Um, let's load it into. It won't touch R three. No, it won't touch R four. Let's load it into R four, um, and then yeah, SRAM, and then move that into R zero, and then we'll compare that. So for the stack pointer, um, let's just give it. Uh, let's go down to our SRAM addresses. Let's give it SRAM Bank five. Which isn't, it's not actually going to uh, write into SRAM Bank 5 because the stack grows downwards. This is going to eat into SRAM Bank 4. So um, I think it's just a smart idea just to give a core its own, uh, its own bank for its stack. So then uh, let's load SRAM Bank 5 in. And then for our entry point, let's, um, let's go back up here. So let's say at this loop, um, we read this, uh, read the CPU ID register. Let's create an entry point. So we'll just call that ent. So the idea is that when it enters this address, it will, um, it will read a CPU ID, which would be one, and we should get a single blank. So now let's send our entry point. So we'll just um, use a cool. I think this is a cool function ADR. So ADR into R4, and uh, you'll want to, uh, because this is thumb mode, we have to set the thumb bit. And how ARM differentiates between thumb mode is ARM, and ARM mode is uh, the first bit in the address, so we'll just add one. So uh, thumb mode is always, uh, that first bit is always set. And that doesn't mean that that's the address of the instruction. The instruction should be one byte behind the address, but that's just, that's just how um that's how it differentiates between R mode and thumb mode. Now let's go up here and uh, call that function. So right before entry, we'll branch to init core. So now uh, both cores will go through this function, but only one will blink the LED note before I test this I changed the function so um, I, th I figured it'd be infinitely easier if we just gave all the addresses as uh, as arguments so here I have I load SRAM into R0 load the bank into R1 and then the entry point into R2 this is just because of like as you can see here I had a lot of errors with range and alignment so th this is this will just make things infinitely uh, easier and all this looks like in terms of code uh, down here. I just move R0 into R4, R1 to R5, R2 to R6. And then I just, um, you know, move those registers back into R0 when needed. So for the big moment of truth, let's uh, load that code on. And we've got a blink telling us that core one is in motion. So the last thing I want to talk about tonight is the spin lock. There are 32 of them on this chip, and the spin lock is essentially just a talking stick. It's what the core is used to symbolize the right to a specific resource. So let's say if like the cores are sharing a buffer, and it'd just be too inefficient to send this buffer over the FIFAs, so they decide to have a specific si uh, spin lock symbolize the right to access this buffer. So when core 0 accesses this buffer, It'll claim the spin lock, uh, which gives, symbolizes that it's using it, uh, perform whatever operation, and when it's done, it'll release the spin lock, and then core one has the ability to then claim the spin lock when it uses the buffer. I hope that wasn't too confusing since the operation is very simple. All you got to do is uh, read from this register, so like each spin lock, there's 32 of them, has its own register, so you read from that register, 
and if it's locked, it will return a zero. Uh, if it's not locked, it will return a, a non-zero number, which will be the value of one shifted over by the lock number. So if you're trying to claim uh, spin lock three, it will return an eight. And uh, once you successfully read that, it will then claim the spin lock. So once you read from an unclaimed spin lock, uh, you claim it. And then to release the lock, you just write a value to it. And all of this is done to avoid race conditions, though um, because it is possible to have a race condition trying to claim a spin lock, core zero will always have priority. So to see this in action, let's say we have, uh, let's make two loops. So um, instead of just having this general loop, let's uh, create core zero and uh, we won't read this CPU ID. What we'll do, let's just send a three. So let's core zero will send a three but before it does, it has to have the spin lock. So we'll load the CO. And I believe this spin lock has a pretty far out. Yeah. So we'll have to add 128 twice to that to get up to speed. And once we have that address, we'll just pull spin lock zero. And then we'll say branch. Oh. Yeah, we'll have to compare it. So compare it with zero and then branch if equal back to the beginning. So while uh, while the spin lock is locked, it will just stay in this loop. Once it's done, it will start blinking. Uh, let's just create some delay so we don't loop uh, loop back around too much. And then let's copy this entire function for core one. So now instead of blinking a three, let's blink a five. So uh, we can tell who has the spin lock by who is blinking uh, their number. And let's load that uh, core one entry address into our uh, init core function. So now let's see who gets the spin lock first. And that looks like core one uh, grabbed it, but um, you can see the beauty of multi-core programming right here. Once the once one core releases its spin lock, the other one will grab it. So we're just kind of stuck in this uh, cycle of uh, blink. So yeah.